to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway, only on Sputnik Radio. Well, we're taking your calls now on any of the subjects we've talked about this evening. Israel, Iran, the Olympic Games, and the subject we're about to address, the extremely important subject of China. China is subject to a kind of orchestra. It's orchestrated, and the conductor is not hard to identify. And that orchestra, like any orchestra, has different sections. A string section, a, a brass section, percussion section, and so on. And one section is brought in as the conductor decides. Everything from Tibet to the Falun Gong, uh, to the Uyghur situation, uh, the situation of Chinese Muslims as a whole, China's role in Africa, Taiwan, Huawei, one section after another is brought in by the conductors, hoping to build this crescendo of hatred against China. Why? Well, China is breathing down the necks of the United States. It's the second biggest economy in the world. It's the biggest country in the world in terms of population. It has the brightest economic future in the world. That's why my children, although very small, are all going to Chinese school. Because by the time they grow up and enter the labor market, a good knowledge of Chinese will be much more valuable than a new, a new knowledge of Latin. I see that the British government has reverted to type on that. China is the victim of multiple calumnies, mainly generated uh, by the very same engine rooms that brought us the calumnies that preceded uh, the invasion and occupation of Iraq, uh, the invasion and occupation of Libya, uh, the invasion and occupation of Syria, uh, the war against Yemen, and so on and so on. But there's a difference. China is in a position to answer back. They have their own television platform, CGTN, uh, which broadcasts in English and has an increasingly ready audience all over the world, nearly as big as the audience of the mother of all talk shows. And that's why I'm particularly happy to welcome Li Jingjing, who's a journalist and broadcaster on that very same broadcaster, CGTN. Very nice to meet you, madame. Uh, it's, uh, I've followed your work for a, for a long time. Uh, Let's start with what I just said by way of introduction. Do you agree with me that these stories, I call them calumnies, uh, these slanders against China are not organic. Uh, they don't emerge out of nowhere. They are deliberately generated by people who want to slow China down at least and help to break China up at worst. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Uh, but first, thanks for having me, George. I've been following your work for a while as well, so I'm very really glad to be here. So first, um, we've been hearing all kinds of horrendous claims about China made by the West, either it's about Xinjiang, Hong Kong, um, Tibet, uh, COVID. So, and uh, all this, but if you actually talk to those people who actually been to those regions, for example, Xinjiang, if you talk to people who actually been to Xinjiang, either diplomats, expats, uh, local Chinese, Uyghurs, students, you will hear a different stories. Many people who made those allegations on Western mainstream media, they are either never been to Xinjiang or they went there, but distorted the facts. Okay, so one of the major allegation that have been talked about recently is about the, they're saying that China is committing genocide towards Uyghurs in Xinjiang, which is far from the truth. 
I, as a journalist that actually visited Xinjiang many times over the past few years, witnessed the changes of Xinjiang. I went there not just for work, also for my personal vacations. And also I conducted thorough interviews with lots of Uyghurs, locals, and also, also, also people of different ethnic groups. And they come from all walks of life. Some of them are uh, Islamic religious leaders, some are imams, some are farmers, some are artists. They tell me completely different stories from what you normally hear on Western mainstream media. Uh, for example, the genocide. I can give you some data. Um, the, according to the latest and also the seventh national demographic census, the population of Uyghurs in Xinjiang grew by 1.8 million. The growth rate is 18.52%, higher than all other ethnic minorities in Xinjiang, and also higher than the national average. Um, and also uh, the life expectancy of people in Xinjiang grew from 30 in the year 1949 to 72 now. So I don't know which genocide in the world that actually boosts the population of a certain ethnic group. And not just by not just boosting the population, um, actually Uyghurs and all the other ethnic minorities in China have many privileges to get better education, to get better employment. Uh, for example, kids of all ethnic minorities in China can gain this extra points for college entrance exam, which is a pretty fierce competitive uh, exam in China. Every year, millions of Chinese kids took in this exam trying to go to college. So a few points can make a big difference. And all the kids from different ethnic groups can get a few points to dozens of points based on the population of their ethnic group. And a few months ago, I interviewed a Uyghur girl, Uyghur influencer. Her name is uh, Sabila. Uh, she, she told me she actually gained 30 points when she took the college entrance exam. That is a lot. That will, that's the difference of one can go to the university or not, or go to, go to a mediocre university or top university. So many Chinese kids would kill to get that many extra points. And all, all the companies, the local governments in China were also in, are also encouraged to, to, uh, to hire ethnic minorities. I have uh, quizzed people on this. The, they use the word genocide to imply a killing, slaughter, uh, the wiping out of a population. And there are many uh, fools who are fooled by that. But when you get them in an interview, uh, they quickly have to acknowledge that while well, China isn't actually killing these people at all, by genocide, we mean, they then say, though, of course, their implication was completely otherwise. By genocide, we mean the destruction of their way of life, particularly their Islamic way of life. What would you mm. say to that? Okay, so let's talk about it culturally. Uh, about the Islamic, uh, the Muslims. Um, first, uh, I need to, I think, to make it, need to make it clear: not all Uyghurs are Muslims. Not all Muslims are Uyghurs. Actually, there are over ten different ethnic ethnic groups in China are uh, Muslims, and some Uyghurs chose not to be Muslims. So the religious group are not necessarily connected with ethnic groups. And uh, about the freedom of Muslims in China. Currently, there are 35,000 mosques across China. And in Xinjiang alone, there are 24,000. And there are several in China, in, in, just in Beijing, the city that I'm living in right now. And actually, just a few months ago, I, I was invited to visit several mosques in, in Mongolia and in, in Xinjiang. And d even though I'm a woman and I'm not a Muslim, the imam showed me the greatest kindness and hospitality because they're very nice and peaceful people. They welcome non-believers to come in to get to know about them. So they allowed me to visit their five prayers a day, show me what time they do the five prayers and what um, like Islam is really about. And in that city, um, is uh, called Bayanur, a small city in the Mongolia. In that small city alone, there are 44 mosques. <laughs> 
And uh, it's funny, actually, the funny part of the conversation, the imam of that mosque, when I asked them, well, a lot of people in the West are saying you guys are being oppressed. You, do, you guys don't have the religious freedom. What do you say? And the imam laughed. And he said, do you think the Americans really care about us Muslims? They created and founded terrorists. And uh, when, the, when they don't listen to them, they label them as terrorists. So he, as a Muslim, as an imam, doesn't it feel like think these allegations from the West towards them is totally absurd. And, and not only that, like Islamic people, he, as a leader of, uh, of this uh, mosque, he constantly meets religious leaders from other religions, like Buddhism, Taoism, Christianity. Uh, they constantly uh, sit down with each other to understand each other and also organize charity works to help the citizens, to help the people in poverty. So uh, the reality in China is not only those people have religious freedom, they coexist with each other quite harmoniously. And that's the, for the Muslims. And also some people are saying there are cultural, cultural genocide, right? Um, so there are also Uyghurs that are not Muslims. Let's talk about how their lives are like. It's because I saw some of those allegations from those people. Some are saying the Uyghurs, the Muslims are forced to eat pork. There are no halal restaurants, which is totally a lie. Because I cannot count how many halal restaurants are here in Beijing, in Xinjiang, everywhere. And there's a halal restaurant right in our office buildings. There are several halal restaurants in our campuses in different schools. Um, so it's totally a lie. And also some people are saying Uyghurs are not allowed to say their language. They are not allowed to use their language. That, I think, that doesn't even need me to debunk. Anyone with well-functioned ears and eyes, they will see Uyghur language being written, being said by local people. All the road signs, all the public signs or name of restaurant are required, uh, in Xinjiang, are required to write, uh, to be written in two languages. One is the language of the local minorities, the other is Mandarin, the national language. It's, it's required by the law. And actually, in those autonomous regions, it is required by the law that the minorities' language needs to be above the national language, Mandarin. And if you go to schools in Xinjiang, in Tibet, you will see Uyghur language classes. You will see Tibetan language classes. Uyghurs are speaking their language to each other all the time. So, well, uh, what, they, uh, uh, what they're referring to, really, is a conflict uh, between the Chinese state and the Al-Qaeda franchise uh, in uh, that province, uh, that used to be proscribed in Britain and the United States as a terrorist organization, uh, but which is no longer on our list of terrorist organizations. Even though uh, these Al-Qaeda Uyghurs have been found in their thousands fighting in Syria, in Libya, even recently in Nagorno-Karabakh, in the war uh, between uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan. They have quite obviously committed terrorist acts in China. They're on video. Their aftermath is on video. Uh, that's who China is fighting, not the Muslims, not the Uyghurs. The extremists. Yeah. They are, they are, um, they are the kind of fanatics that we fight here, although sometimes we encourage them in other places. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So the issue that in Xinjiang, that the, the real issue was the terrorist attacks conducted by the, the group that you just mentioned, ETIM, the East Turkestan Islamic Movement. They, uh, since the 1980s, uh, late 1980s to early 1990s, until 2014, 2015, around that time, uh, there were about thousands of terrorist attacks happened in Xinjiang, across Xinjiang, in different scales. Among them, uh, several are widely known. Uh, for example, the July the 5th terrorist attacks in Rumchi uh, led to hundreds of people killed, thousands of people injured. And that, that those people were not just Han people, 
they killed Uyghurs as well, people of other ethnic groups as well. And another, th th those attacks are not just happening in Xinjiang, it spread it to other parts of China and other parts of the world. Another famous one was uh, in 2014, uh, they uh, conducted this uh, a massacre at a Kunming railway station, uh, killing people regardless of their ethnic backgrounds, their age, their gender. So that terrorist group is responsible for thousands of terrorist attacks in, inside of China, outside of China. They are responsible for all those lives. Actually, that group was uh, also, that terrorist group was recognized, listed by the United Nations and also listed by George W. Bush. But Mike Pompeo delisted, which I think basically reveals the hypocrisy of American politicians. They will list those people as terrorist groups when they think they can use, um, uh, that can ha help China to join to counter to fight this terror terrorism, and they would delist the terrorist organization when they think they can use it to continue to push this narratives uh, in Xinjiang. So well, it's uh, totally we, we we kill such people uh, on London Bridge, uh, quite rightly, uh, when they have killed other people. Uh, we kill them by drones, uh, where we can find them. Uh, we say we are committed to wiping them out on the battlefield. Uh, that's what we do. And when we capture them alive, we put them in the, in the dungeon. Uh, we put them in uh, Belmarsh, maximum security prison, the two beasts who slaughtered in broad daylight. We jail them for a hundred years. They will never see the light of day again. That's what we do. What does China do in its fight against these uh, terrorists? Mm -hmm. um, I th uh, the the mass Western politicians and some Western media are constantly using the term concentration camps, which is far from the truth. China uh, admitted there are vocational training centers for those uh, extremists. Uh, those, that's vocational training centers, not concentration camps, because they provide professional skills training, uh, de-radicalization courses, and also give them better educations. Um, so I actually interviewed several former trainees of those vocational training centers. And there were women, uh, the two female trainees, I, I, when I asked them, BBC is saying that you guys are being systematically raped in those in those uh, centers. Is that true? You can feel the they are totally outrageous at this allegation because not only none of none of the, of the torture or rape happened in those centers, they actually formed a very close connections with the teachers, with the staff there, because not, they are not just helping them in the school, they also help them outside of the school. So uh, at the, until very recently, in the recent four to five years, there were no terrorist attacks happen at all in China. I think that's a, that proves that's a pretty effective way of de-radicalization. And what, the, what those centers that provide those people are professional skills because after analyzing the reason that led to the uh, extreme thoughts, uh, one is of definitely because of the terrorist group's influence. They taught the locals uh, what they are teaching them are not the proper Islam. Um, so and also some of the people were being manipulated because they didn't have many material sources. They didn't have many educational educations. So they're easily, easily manipul manipulated. So what China did is lift those people out of poverty, um, teach them more skills. Those women learned skills like how to use computers, how to speak the national language. So they have more work opportunities. 
they uh, now after graduation, some of them are working at this women co committee. Some working uh, have their own plots of land, have their started their own businesses. So leave those people out of poverty, uh, give them material sources, and also deradicalization. So you don't need to kill those people. You act, can actually improve their labor living standards. Well, uh, now we don't have all night, of course, uh, unfortunately. Uh, so let me go to uh, a quite different subject. Uh, mm -hmm. It might be beyond your purview, uh, but uh, certainly long before you were born, uh, the Royal Navy uh, sent a ship up the Yangtze, which uh, the uh, Red Navy in 1949 sank. It became quite an incident. It was called the Yangtze Incident. Uh, it was regarded as uh, extraordinarily bold of the Chinese to sink a British warship because, of course, we were used to sending our warships to bombard China without reply. Now, for some reason that none of us can fathom, our prize naval asset has been dispatched bristling with weapons uh, into the South China Sea. How is China going to react to this provocative display of NATO military assets in Chinese waters? Um, I think I cannot say on behalf of uh, the military or the government here because I don't I'm not working for the government, I'm not working with the military, I don't know what their reactions will be. But as an ordinary Chinese, I think Chinese people or Chinese governments will no longer uh, be bullied. Um, British, British history in China is not, how to say, uh, it's quite humiliating for a lot of Chinese. For example, not just the South China Sea. Um, we all know about the history in Hong Kong, how Britain took it as its colony. And it's a humi humiliation for Chinese, even though 100 years passed. And also in Tibet, many people also didn't know about this fact that actually Britain invaded Tibet twice in the late 18th, 18th century and early 19th. They killed a lot of Tibetans, thousands of Tibetans, recognized Tibet is part of China because they want Qing Dynasty to pay the compensation for their soldiers died on the way killing Tibetans. So Britain had a lot of history invading the territories, territories of China in Hong Kong, in Tibet, and Chinese nowadays will no longer allow it to happen again. Okay, thank you very much indeed for joining us. I hope this can be a regular thing uh, because uh, there is so much, to continue the nautical metaphor, there is a tidal wave of anti-China propaganda in Western countries and it is good to get someone who can succinctly and well uh, answer some of the calumnies. A counter orchestra, you may say, an orchestra that I'd be very happy to help conduct. Thank you very much for joining us, Li Jingjing. Thank you. On the Thank you, of George. All talk shows.